Okay, so now what about the other relationship? So again, this says gives free energy, but really we recognize that we could call that chemical potential versus pressure. Okay, and so we remember mu equals molar gives free energy and also the partial of that chemical potential with respect to changes in pressure at constant temperature equals molar volume. So all of these curves represent molar volume, okay? And we also note that the molar volume of a gas, I'm going to actually give myself much more room. We note the molar volume of a gas um, really is much greater than the molar volume of a liquid, um, which in most cases is greater than the molar volume of a solid, except water. Okay? So the solid phase of water is less dense than the liquid phase, which means the molar volume of H2O as a liquid is, or excuse me, the molar volume of H2O as a solid is greater than the molar volume of a liquid. So water is our exception. And there's not a whole lot of other things that have this property. You are, would be really hard pressed to find other materials that share this property with water, okay? And so now if I expand on this a little bit, because you notice that the liquid and the solid are fairly constant, okay? So for example, the molar volume under standard conditions of H2O as a gas, um, we know is 22.42 liters per mole. But we also know that the molar volume of a gas is subject to change. So that's why we can really see a PV equals NRT situation going on here to describe the volume of this gas. Or really, I should say, um, you know, V equals NRT over P. That's really what's driving the curvature on this, okay? But the molar volume of solids and liquids, they are subject to change. They can very much change. As you know, density is a function of temperature. Um, but they're quite stable. So the change of these things is not a whole lot. And the molar volume of a liquid under standard conditions of water is 0 0.0180 liters per mole. And the molar volume standard of H2O as a solid is actually 0 0.0196 liters per mole. So again, most of the time, the volume of a liquid should be greater than the volume of a solid, but water is our exception. Now you might be asking, how did I get these numbers? Okay, well check it out, it's liter per mole. So I got this number from using the approximate density of one milliliter per gram. I know that's backwards. I know you wanna say one gram per milliliter, but I wanna get this in terms of volume, not in terms of mass. So if I use you know 1.000000 milliliter per gram, then that's how I get to this number. Um, and then, of course, this is from the approximate 0.9 grams per milliliter or about 1.1 milliliter per gram. So that's where these numbers are coming from. Okay. So now, how do I get a better representation for the molar volume of a gas? Well, if I expand on these relationships here, on these partial derivatives, I can say dGm at constant T equals Vm dp so all i did was split up these two partials okay and now what i want to do is integrate from initial to final uh, both sides of this equation um, and what i get is the following i get g m and i'll say at p final equals g m at p initial so that I did one algebra step there that I'm not showing you. So the algebra step was, this turns out to be, um, you know, final minus initial. 
and then I added the initial over to the other side of the equation. And then now when I integrate VM uh, DP, um, and also noting, right, that uh, VM equals RT over P, so we dropped the N because it's now VM that we're talking about. So when I plug in RT, um, right, so this is initial final of RT over P DP. And so hopefully you recognize that's there's going to be a natural log in there, uh, DP over P, right? Um, and so, and the RT is a constant. So what I get is uh, plus RT times the natural log of P final divided by P initial. Okay, or I could also say chemical potential um, of the final pressure equals chemical potential of the initial pressure and of course plus RT natural log of PF over PI. So that's where you see this logarithmic relationship, okay? Coming from this integral right here. All right, and so now to, to kind of think, okay, so what happens now when we combine both of these ideas, right? I showed you this, this potential energy surface. So this might be the surface of a pure phase, but how do we get a phase diagram out of this? Well, what I would need to do is calculate this surface free energy or surface chemical potential of the liquid, the solid, the gas, put them all together, right, on the same plot, and where we see them crossing like this, that's where we get phase transitions. And we note that it's not gonna be a single point where they cross, rather it's gonna be a whole series of points where they cross because these are three-dimensional surfaces. Um, so I did this in Igor um, because I wanted to use data that I had. Um, and then here's what I came up with. So this is pretty cool stuff. So in this plot here, my solid is green, okay? My liquid is kind of this rather blue color. Um, and my gas is this red color. And you can see that they kind of have that curvature that you saw from that previous plot. But still, how do we get a phase diagram out of this? Well, what we need is the minimums, right? So I'll play with this red curve, for example. So if I'm looking at just this slice, um, maybe just this slice, let's say along the 0.1 um, ATM, so at constant P, right? So here at 400 Kelvin, I can see my gas is the lowest chemical potential. So for water between 400 Kelvin, and then look at my scale, right? Between 400 and, you guessed it, 273, um, the gas is the most stable. But then now we get to this um, point, and what's actually really, really difficult to note here because of the way this is crossing, you might be thinking, well, what about the boiling point, 373? Well, look, that's at one atmosphere. I don't even have one atmosphere on this scale. But that boiling point, if it were on this scale, would actually be somewhere up there. Okay? Because here you can follow the 373 mark. So in other words, this curve that you see manifesting is really all of my boiling points. Okay? But now this is really difficult to see. However, you can tell there's a bit of curve crossing right there from the solid, and then there's another bit of curve crossing from the liquid. So it's really difficult to see it on this scale. So what I did here was you take this three-dimensional diagram, flip it upside down, because what you want to observe are the minima, and this is what you get. An upside down 3D graph. So we're, we're literally, this is this color graph that I'm showing you. It's literally a three-dimensional graph. It's just been flipped. So imagine this plot that I'm showing you, right? We want to look at the bottom side. So it's just been flipped up to show you that bottom side. And now we're only seeing the pressure versus the temperature. And all of these boundaries here, so I highlighted them with the dotted lines because um, my curve crossing, you know, this was an approximate exercise I did 
where my surfaces crossed didn't turn out to be exactly correct. And I'll talk about that as we proceed through phase diagrams. And there's a lot of error associated in constructing a phase diagram. Um, so this didn't do too bad at recreating um, those points. So in other words now, um, let's go, here's temperature on this scale. All of these data points represent boiling at various pressures, okay? All of these data points along these line represent melting at different pressures, okay? And that's pretty cool. And as you can see, you know, as my graph starts to approach one ATM, my boiling point is starting to approach that magic 373, 100 degrees Celsius. So this is how you make a phase diagram. Pretty cool stuff, okay? And you really have to have like an alien brain to imagine how to like flip these things around and what you're looking at and so on. So very, very cool stuff.